reply? The, before, the question is that the address be agreed to. And before I call the member for Gilmore, I just want to remind the House uh, that it is the member's uh, maiden speech, and I accordingly ask members in the chamber to accord the usual uh, courtesies. Deputy Speaker, over 50 years ago, John F. Kennedy, in his inaugural speech, made one of the most famous statements in modern democracy, inspiring a nation to participate rather than commentate. He said, ask not what your country can do for you, but rather what you can do for your country. <clears throat> Today we commemorate the life of Nelson Mandela, who not only did something for his country, but is iconic for developing community self-belief. For some of us, the idea of doing something for our country is too broad, a little too big, a concept meant for others, something grand, perhaps only for heroes, perhaps something to do with pilots, sailors or soldiers. But humans live in groups, each best described as a community. <clears throat> so for us as Australians, our question is to ask not what we can do for our country, but rather what can we do for our community. We have been beguiled by the marketing of such things as my choice, my store, my school, my rights and my opinion. But we are not a collection of selfish individuals. We are a society. Well, I'm tired of this I, me and mine dominating the media and seeping into the mindset of our children and our youth. It's overdone and overdue. We need a change, a change back to the Aussie way. We are famous for we, ours and us way of looking at the world. So if each one of us does something for our community, we'll make life just a little better and our whole country will benefit. It is this ideal of making things better, of giving back to the community, that has brought me here as a member of parliament. <clears throat> I was born in Milton, a village on the south coast of New South Wales. My dad, a young man, Norrie Harding, as he was known in the village, and my mum, his British immigrant bride, Valerie. Dad was a manual arts teacher, mum, his wife. Back in the day, that was a full-time role, and few people undervalued how important being a mum really was. My dad was also a freelance photographer at the local paper. During a photographic accident, something to do with a light bulb blowing up, he sustained a severe eye injury, ultimately swapping it for a glass one. That actually wasn't quite a colour match. Soon after, we moved to Sydney to live with my grandmother. These three people fashioned the core of my character. My mother, constantly baking and sewing for school fates and other community groups, established an ethic of community service as part of my childhood. She also sang and wrote stories, much as she does to this day, which inspired my love of language and performance arts. My father taught me bushcraft, the love of woodworking, stone building, how to use hammers, chisels and drills, and the absolute joy of the Australian bush. He taught me about belly tea and jaffles, red belly black snakes, and the scent of the baronia bush, memories that we all share. And my much-loved gran, who loved me unconditionally, well, grandmother doesn't, mm -hmm. as a baby was left on a church doorstep as a foundling child, called Norma after Norman, the minister who discovered her, and they hoped to find her mother, so she was named Norma Hope. She taught me generosity of spirit, that we are all equal in God's eyes, and that your actions will always come back to you, like a boomerang. So make sure whatever you do, it's done without ill will and have faith in the greater good of everyone. My childhood was shared with my brother Stuart. We have always been very close, for at times I was his mini-mum. We share a deep regard and friendship that continues to this day. <clears throat> my education, like many Australian children, was not completed in a sing single primary school, nor followed by a single high school. I was in fact blessed, except I didn't see it at the time, by moving frequently and having to make new friends along the way, learning to accept all the different experiences. After completing my science degree, <clears throat> during which time I also gained a wedding ring and two beautiful sons, Rodney and Barry, and all the additional learning that you do as a young mother, I began a career as a high school science teacher. Ten years passed in this most honoured yet undervalued profession, that of educating, facilitating, nurturing and developing young adults towards their full potential. 
One of my greatest wishes is that we renew our respect for teachers and their vital role in creating and maintaining the fabric of our society, that we value them and that we have values in education as a mainspring for the future of our nation. Many people do not value teachers, and they do not, in general, value education, often using it as an expedient political football because it has so many emotional hooks, going for big picture changes rather than asking the teachers on the job about their vision for improvement. It was during my time as a teacher that the importance of basic skills, literacy and social responsibility became very significant. I co-developed literacy-based learning in my classes and was lucky enough to be selected as an exchange teacher to share these ideas in New York. In addition to establishing lifelong friendships, such as those I share with the Coston family, Chris and Warwick have seen me through many life adventures, and still we share the odd pizza and coffee. The years teaching were very rewarding. My beautiful daughter, Kimberly, was born during this time. It was a busy time of community involvement with playgroups, cubs, little athletics, swim classes, music and gym classes, as well as all the other life-spinning activities that many parents grapple with and try to keep in life balance. After the exchange teaching opportunity, our family moved to Kayama on the south coast to explore the great adventures, the financial roller coaster, and the challenge of owning our own business. So the experienced economic research officer, my then husband, and I, the science teacher, embarked on the journey of making fudge. It was during this time I learned the immense contribution that small business makes to local economies in terms of direct employment and local spend dollars by the employees, creating hubs of activity, building with expansion and donating to local groups, apart from paying taxes. I calculate my company via the taxes we paid could have built two preschools over 20 years. When moving from teaching to being a business owner, many friends laughed and said, making money from fudge in a small coastal town, impossible. But it wasn't. We changed a small country industry with just three employees to a business with over 40 staff, exporting to six international destinations. I'm sure there will be looks of astonishment today, just as there was back then. However, it goes to show that if you apply yourself, work hard, and listen to the people you serve, you can be successful. Yeah. I was also elected to Kayama Council during this time. When you grow a business, you often confront ridiculous red tape. After challenging the local council on building changes, in the following election, I was invited to run as a candidate. So Neville Fredericks and your beautiful wife, Jill, your encouragement and confidence at that time were the catalyst for the pathway that has brought me here, the member for Gilmore. Madam Speaker, after 17 years as part of a successful, dynamic and very intense business, it was time to give back to the wider community. There followed a very special period of volunteer work in India, living in a rural village in Tamil Nadu. This period reinforced my love of teaching and I returned to Australia to complete my Masters of Education. I later used this qualification to tutor at the University of Wollongong in the Diploma of Education program. Giving back to the community has always been important to me. Being a youth leader, mentoring young women's leadership programs, youth forums and business startups were ways of making things better. Over the six-year period of the last government, I did not see my beloved Australia getting better. Rather, I saw many more families struggling to make ends meet, struggling to stay employed and struggling to make sense of the way things were being done in their community and in their country. I saw with horror the students retained at school until they were 17, destroying real learning for those who wished to be there and watching their loss of self-esteem as they struggled to keep up with work that was completely beyond them and seeing the frustration on the faces of the teachers as they noted the complexities of demands that this policy change caused. When this country introduced a policy that directed all students towards university education, we set in place a pathway for many to fail. There are other far more relevant avenues that lead to much better outcomes, richer self-esteem and, above all, the essential skills that we need. I saw wasted educational investment because some schools were unable to choose where to spend the grants. I saw houses left empty, 
yet there were broken families, victims of domestic violence and people suffering from mental illness living in cars because there was no accommodation available. I saw photographic evidence of pink bats being brought to a person's house but left rolled up in the roof cavity. I saw subsidies and special bonuses being misspent and misallocated. I saw effective programs being cut and others where the submissions for funding sat on a desk for several months while the government of the day changed ministers in the merry-go-round of leadership challenges. And in all these, I did not see a true application of making things a little better. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, Gilmore has been well represented by Joanna Gash, yeah. Yeah. our friend and significant mentor. She has always and continues in her capacity as mayor of the Shoalhaven to put the community first. There was a strong advocate in this woman establishing the Shoalhaven campus of the University of Wollongong, millions of dollars in small and large grants for innovative industry and community groups, the just about completed Main Road 92, and the millions of dollars gained for roads and infrastructure. It is my intention to maintain this advocacy. Yeah. Gilmore is undoubtedly one of the most beautiful areas in Australia, with its amazing beaches, hinterland, rivers and wetland areas. Although every member here believes that they represent the best, I oh, know I've got that honour. <laughs> At the same time, Gilmore has some of the most significant social complexities to deal with. A low manufacturing base, struggling dairy farms, intermittent transport options, high unemployment and an ageing demographic. The greatest employment growth sectors are those in hospitality and aged care, both traditionally low-end income streams. There are simply not enough services for the needs of many in Gilmore, especially those with mental illness or disability. I have a dream is another iconic statement, but I do have a dream. I see my community with better transport options, increased infrastructure investment, more employment options, education choices, and above all, a community that believes in itself as achievers, with hope for their futures and reward for their endeavours. I see the potential growth for the Shoalhaven University campus. I see a vibrant and self-confident community. It won't happen straight away, but it will happen. By working together at all levels, we will actually achieve. If each of us believe that our small contribution to our community by joining a local service club or volunteering in one of the community groups, such as Surf Life Saving, Rural Fire Service, State Emergency Service or St John's Ambulance, and give our time, we will make a difference, we will make things better, and then we will do something for our community. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, there are a number of people who have motivated the person who now stands before you. Joanna Gash, previous member for Gilmore, who's helped guidance and gentle suggestion. Now those who really know Jo are laughing. <laughs> Perhaps I'm understating. Has assisted me to come to Parliament and follow my dream of making my country better. Of course, my children, who encouraged me from a distance as two now live in Cairns. My daughter Kimberly, with words of humour, practicality during the tough days, and has simply been my best friend. Barry, who, when I first suggested I might run for parliament, said, Mum, better to have lived and tried than to have lived with regret. His constant support over many years has been a mainstay, and on Monday, with his lovely wife Ramay, will bring my granddaughter into the world. And Rodney, who unstintingly dropped all his activities, came down in the final months to door knock, letterbox, pre-poll constantly, despite never having done any of it before. <laughs> to my adopted son, Brad State, and my adopted daughter, Bonnie Marshall, who have been my campaign companion since April 2012, there are simply not enough donuts and hot chocolates to say thank you. <laughs> they were also the connection to the young Liberals, who, under the stewardship of Dean Carlson and Alison Richards, came in the worst of weather to help in the difficult areas with letterboxing. Thank you to my local young Liberals, especially Jackson Calverley, who was the youngest booth captain of them all. Also to Larissa Mallinson, who assisted in Gilmore before deciding to run as a candidate in Throsby. Madam Speaker, there are always a number of very close associates who help in a campaign, and they stand with you through thick and thin. I thank John Bennett, chair of my FEC, for his unending, straightforward advice, Pat Davis for her constant wisdom in organising the village visits. Bruce, who often did the last-minute deliveries, Richard and Maxine Warner, 
for the hundreds of A-frames and handing out at train and bus stations. Dorothy Barker, one of the most amazing door knockers of all time, never hesitating at any door or any gate or any driveway. To Pam Coles, coordinating the files and the maps, as well as being major support. Jan Hancock, whose compassionate and beautiful voice convinced so many to become part of the thousand strong team, men and women, to man the booths. The Marshall family for the famous blue trailer. Bill Carter and Danielle, who drove the old bus around. To Ellie and Jeff Rose, who looked after the old bus. To Kelly Marsh and her son Nathan, the best northern campaigners. John and Kath Labar, staunch supporters throughout, even from the beginning, way back in 2006. Patricia and Gary White, the southern campaigners. Kay McNiven and Gavin McClure, whose assistance in so many ways was wonderful. David and Sandy Smith, whose ability to make me believe in myself was so very evident and they were always there to help. To Eve Craddock, who was thrown completely in the deep end and saved us all from campaign stress with her organising and holding the team together, not to mention the scones and cookies. I thank my state colleagues Gareth Ward, member for Kiama, and the Honourable Shelley Hancock, Speaker of the House in the New South Wales Legislative Assembly, member for South Coast, especially Shelley, for her understanding during the campaign. Thank you to the team at HQ, Michelle Moffat and Mark Neam in particular, as my point of official connection, Sanjay and John Dee for always being available. To the many members of the Liberal Party branches in Gilmore who have worked on fundraisers and booths, coming to shadow ministers' events, participating in auctions and games, buying endless tickets for items they really didn't want, but it was all for a good cause. I thank my supporters here today, many having made quite a journey to still show support, and some are not even party members, but believed I had potential, at least in part, to fill the shoes of Joanna Gash, for I was constantly told, you have big shoes to fill. I do, unfortunately, have fairly small feet. So I'll just have to run to make up the difference. Not only did my local community remind me often that this would be an issue, but so did many of my colleagues now sitting here and working with me. I was, of course, blessed during the campaign by two bishops, an abbot, several religious leaders and many shadow ministers. Apart from the intended pun, I was in indeed supported in so many ways by the Honourable Bronwyn Bishop, now in the Speaker's chair, an elegant and eloquent person who has inspired so many women in politics on this side, for which we, I personally am very grateful. Madam Speaker, you've been a stalwart support for me for a very long time, and I thank you. I was also supported by Julie Bishop, Philip Raddock, Joe Hockey, Christopher Pine, Malcolm Turnbull, Scott Morrison, John Cobb, Bob Baldwin, Greg Hunt, Senators Maurice Payne, Bill Heffernan, Connie Ferravanti Wells, each adding colour, flair, and knowledge to the campaign and not least our Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, who came and conquered in the Carbon Tax Forum, making sure the Gilmore community and they understood the dreadful impact of this badly thought out policy had on local employment, carbon tax, affecting local industry, local families and local employment. I thank them all from the bottom of my heart. More recently, I've had the support of the Liberal Women's Council and my colleagues now sitting on the benches with me as we made friends, the day we stood before the cameras for the core flutes, oh my goodness, that day in May 2012 seemed so far away. Karen McNamara, Fiona Scott, Lucy Wicks, Craig Laundy, Peter Hendy and Angus Taylor have all been great sources of support on a common journey, and I look forward to working hard alongside them, although at times we may compete for funding to be allocated to our electorates, we already share a great bond. <laughs> I thank the teachers who have appeared in my life at different times, and many have given lessons when I least expected. For some unknown reason, many of them have the name Linda. Linda A taught me, you never put your head in an oven with a lighted match just to see if at first ignition it worked. Singed eyebrows and eyelashes are not becoming. Linda C taught me the power of the paintbrush, and Linda D gave me the craft of pencil and charcoal. Linda W took me, taught me to look out for myself in all things legal and financial, and finally, Linda M, who reminded me of my connection to God and taught me the power of prayer. There have, of course, been other teachers in my life. Dr John Nicholas, who taught our Dip Ed class the holistic view of the environment. 
making us look beyond the limits of flora, fauna and natural habitat to the interaction of people, the necessity of the built environment and all its demands on the social and survival fabric of human existence, that effectively our environment sits in balance between the tripod of these three aspects, natural, human and built. I thank these teachers for all they have taught me and I thank all those who I have taught for those experiences amongst the ones I cherish the most. I take this opportunity to also thank those descendants of Australia's first people who have shared their love of country, their techniques in painting and others who taught me to listen to wisdom in the silence amongst the rocks of Katajuta, and to those elders in my community, Melissa, Auntie Ruth, Auntie Grace and Uncle Jerry, whose welcome to country gathers up the strings of disunity every time they speak to weave them into a design of reconciliation, understanding and a will to work together. I thank Noel Lonsdale for sharing the possum cloak in a recent unveiling at Boat Harbour, showing the symbolism of our unity. I remind all in this house of Auntie Matilda's words, of Canberra being the womb of Australia. This is the time for renewal and rebirth. The strategies of the recent political path have reflected only division, deception and disloyalty. The result has been chaos for those who sit opposite, but worse still, for families who have been impacted by unintended consequences of bad policy decisions. Mm -hmm. Whilst political bluster may suffice for some, the reality is that our government bank account is in a mess. The players, balance and fiscal responsibility have effectively taken their bat and ball, even the stumps, and gone home. Everyone in this chamber is here to represent the community to the best of their ability. But it is Tony Abbott in the Prime Minister's chair, and it is this side of the House that is in government. I am proud to be part of the team that works to reward individual endeavour, to help people to their feet and allow them the independence of their own choices. There is hope in this strategy for our nation. I deeply honour those in Gilmore who decided to put their faith in me to help change the government in Australia. I also respect those who did not, for we have a robust democracy in this nation. Now, we must work together to achieve great things. I am determined to make sure the trust and honour granted to me is not misplaced. Madam Speaker, Gilmore has extraordinary human capacity and amazing potential. It is time that we in our region believe this, to lift our community and its self-respect, to begin the process of achievement in hope rather than denial of individual merit. We who are leaders, whether community leaders, elected leaders or opinion makers, we have a responsibility to increase the social value in our community's own eyes, despite our own political bias. It is time to go beyond the fa facade of perception and look at the true worth of our community. We in Gilmore are generous beyond many others, giving well above the average for such groups as the Salvation Army and the Red Cross. I should know I've door knocked for both. The network of service clubs, leisure clubs, sports clubs and over 90 church congregations provide assistance locally and internationally whenever they are called upon. We deserve the infrastructure and community investment that will enable us to reach our potential. I look forward to working with the Tony Abbott government to deliver all the projects committed and now confirmed, especially the Shoalhaven Bridge Phase 2 and the funding for the Dun & Lewis Bali Memorial Centre. So the youth of Aladulla have a facility that commemorates their friends lost in the bombing, yet also allows training and workplace opportunities, as well as becoming a community activity hub. We know we have doubled the national average unemployment statistics, and we recognise this as a multi-layered problem. We need all sectors in our community to think outside the square. When unusual opportunities come along, instead of being negative or sceptical, let's encourage the potential. Madam Speaker, in the words of Robert Kennedy, some of us see things as they are and ask why, others dream of things that could be and ask why not. I'm inspired by the school students of Gilmore, some of whom are here today, Gemma and Jake, assisted by Laura, for their energy is contagious and they too share the dream of making a difference. The electorate team, Janelle Brown, Kimberly Wadey, Nikki Macy, Adam Straney, are all working on the vision for Gilmore. Finally, Dad, for, my, for you, as you are unable to see, I am wearing blue and white. And metaphorically, Dad, the sailboat has left the shore. There might be a few barnacles on the hull, might be a few patches on the sails. And Mum, you're the wind in the sails. Rodney, Barry and Kim, you are the invisible hands 
that draw up the anchor, set the sails and hold the tiller, for the journey has begun. Yes, indeed, it seriously is time to ask, what can we do for our community? From the innocence of childhood to the cynicism of adulthood, it's time for a change for the better. It's time for we will. The responsibility is ours. It is absolutely up to us to make things better and make a difference. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Hey, yeah. The question is. That the, address, that the address be agreed to. And before I call the Honourable Member for Hume, I would remind the House that it is the Honourable Member's maiden speech, and I would ask that the same courtesies as have just been extended to the Member for Gilmore be extended to the Member for Hume. I call the Member for Hume. Yeah.